Here to dive in from Hong Kong is Chandra Nair, founder and CEO of the Global Institute for Tomorrow. In London, we have Jacob Parakilis, works on the US project for Chatham House. From Nairobi, we have Masharia Manune. He is a professor of history and international relations at the United States International University. And with me in the studio is Paul Schiff Berman, a professor of law at the George Washington University. Thanks all for joining us, a truly global panel for a global uh, subject. Let's start with you, Paul Schiff Berman, uh, in the studio. You know, the reach of US law is global. We're not just talking about terrorism. We've had, for example, the recent FIFA examples. Why does the US act on this global stage, and is it legal? Well, you know, the essential problem is that human activity crosses territorial borders, and legal systems tend to be territorially bounded. So it's not surprising that communities all over the world feel effects of behavior and activities that happen outside their borders. It could be tax, it could be environmental harms, it could be terrorism. Um, there's lots of things that cross borders. So uh, it's not just the United States. Uh, many, many communities wish to assert jurisdiction over activity that affects people in their borders, but the activity is outside their borders. And so the question is, uh, can they do it, and under what basis they do it? And it is true that the US, uh, uh, because it's such a strong world power, uh, may have more ability, uh, but it's not unique, I think, in wanting to assert jurisdiction over uh, acts or people who are outside their borders. I, I want to go to Nairobi next. Mashari Munani, um, we hear a lot about terrorism suspects being picked up, especially uh, in East Africa, and the next we hear of them, they're in a New York uh, courtroom. Um, as someone from the African continent, what effect does this have in terms of uh, how the US is perceived? For a start, um, the news about people being captured in Eastern Africa, and then they end up in Brooklyn or some other court, is not widespread. Most people don't know about that. Uh, it's only those who take interest get to know about that. Now, in itself, if there's collaboration with the government or the states in the region with the United States, then there is an admission there on the part of the African countries that uh, they are not able to handle those people as well as they should. On the other side, you have the projection of US power, uh, essentially uh, making it appear as if US laws can be applied anywhere globally, uh, not necessarily because uh, they are wanted or they are necessary, but because US is projecting US power. And uh, this is one way of doing that, uh, ensure, or making it appear as if U, uh, U.S. laws are applicable globally to every other uh, area, even if they don't like it. So there are those yeah. two sides uh, to look at at present. Uh, you raise an interesting point. Jacob Parakilis in London, is this just an extension of uh, U.S. power, or is it, do they act in countries where basically they have deals with local governments who maybe don't have the capacity uh, to enforce anti-terrorism laws or for example, uh, take bad guys uh, uh, out, of, uh, out of wars? Uh, well, it's sort of both, because, I mean, you have, on the one hand, sort of U.S. operations in Somalia, places where I think the U.S. judges that there's not a legal system there that can sort of uh, fulfill the obligations or expectations that the State Department and the U.S. authorities are putting on them. But you also have a very long-standing history of cooperation. If you look at Latin America, for example, of extradition of drug traffickers, of cooperation between the DEA and of local uh, law enforcement agencies. So it's sort of, it's a little bit from a you know, bit from column A and bit from column B. Um, and then, of course, you have sort of situations where it doesn't quite work out. I mean, obviously, last weekend, El Chapo Guzman, the Mexican drug capo, escaped from jail after the, uh, Mexico had turned down an extradition request from the U.S. for him. Chandra Naya in Hong Kong, uh, you know, it seems, though, uh, the U.S. Uh, intentions may be right, but they can basically act as uh, judge, jury, and policeman uh, when it comes to this sort of uh, international jurisdiction. What are your thoughts? Well, firstly, I'm curious that you suggest that the intentions may be right. And this is a, <laughs> a sort of gross generalization that people generally make. And I'm not suggesting anything else, but I think this is a, a very casual way of uh, analyzing it. 
Let me preface my comments by saying I think we all agree, I assume we agree, that this is uh, not about whether bad guys or good guys should get away with things that, you know, you or I decide is good or bad. Who are the bad guys anyway? So we're all, you know, I, I think, uh, uh, welcome a world in which, um, you know, uh, there's no uh, impunity for people who commit crimes, etc. The question is, um, uh, this is about whether the dominant hegemon should be allowed to extend itself and reinforce its powers in a way that all the evidence suggests it has done rather recklessly over the last two decades, given poor leadership and domestic-driven agendas playing on a global uh, playing field. That is the question we have to ask, not about whether, you know, we need the U.S. to do this or not. The second question I think we need to ask is, do these actions create a more divided and dangerous world? The evidence would suggest that it does. And then the qu third question is, essentially, it's about whether we allow such unilateralist actions, which mm. the U.S. has essentially embarked on uh, with its supporters, uh, dare I say, the U U.K., et cetera, and its Western allies, I think that's, that's really the question. Then the final point is, therefore, what are the motives for this actions? I think that's what really we're here to discuss, and I have my own views about what motives are. But we should be very clear that um, the world, I don't think, would be a better place by a reckless hegemon behaving in this way, and oh, it's in the U.S. interest either. Thank you so much. Uh, Paul Schipper, I want you to pick up on that point, yeah. uh, creating a more dangerous world. For example, what would happen if, if Donald Rumsfeld was arrested in Spain? Uh, the U.S. would go crazy for, for crimes against humanity in Iraq, for example. And, and isn't this setting a precedent? Perhaps the U.S. should be more multilateral, join the International Criminal Court, capacity build that way. So I actually support the U.S. joining the International Criminal Court, and I think that there would be... Uh, not that much that U.S. officials would have to worry about with regard to international criminal court jurisdiction because the, the international criminal court... But they all are all very worried about I it. I understand that, uh -huh. but the international criminal court only has jurisdiction if the local authority is unwilling or unable uh, to pursue an investigation. Uh, and uh, if there were uh, an incident that... Uh, rose to the level of a human rights, uh, major human rights violation, there almost always is an investigation within the United but States. And so I actually don't think that the concerns that have been raised about the International Criminal Court are so large. But the reality is the, uh, that's not happening. I, I understand that. So, you know, that being said, uh, I think it's important to recognize that when countries, and it's not just the U.S., act uh, outside to try to uh, uh, enforce laws outside their borders, outside their territories, they don't actually do it unilaterally. They have to do it in collaboration with some other entity. So, for instance, when the U.S. wanted some terrorism suspects uh, from some countries in Europe, uh, they weren't always handed over uh, because of concerns about Guantanamo and so forth. And so it's not completely unilateral. If you want to assert jurisdiction beyond your borders, somebody has to be willing to say, that's an okay assertion of jurisdiction. I'm willing to go along with that. I think your court system is uh, going to provide plausible fairness and so on and so forth. So uh, it is true that having multiple I think, I think countries asserting that, multiple jurisdiction in overlapping ways creates messiness. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I also think that that's a reality of a world where there's multiple jurisdictions. Chandra and I, you want to respond to that? Yeah, I think we've all heard these arguments about, you know, that the, the, the U.S. has uh, essentially played by the rules, et cetera. I think uh, it would be churlish of me uh, or anyone to try and suggest, post-Iraq, that it has played by the rules. So this is not an anti-U.S. Uh, debate, et cetera, but it is essentially a discussion about how the rest of the world views it and the threat to multilateralism that these sorts of actions pose. Uh, the U.S. has many client states who, of course, are subservient to the, the military, economic, and other po <coughs> powers that it holds on them, and such, as such do sign bilateral agreements. The ICC is yep. a classic one that the U.S. has worked relentlessly to undermine the ICC by signing bilateral. That but but uh, coming back to the point, I mean, to take the kind of actions that, that the U.S. is currently taking, it needs to have a higher moral ground. 
in the court of public opinion globally, the U.S. does not have a higher moral ground. Right. And therefore, there is great resentment about uh, what it seeks to do, quite often driven by very naive politicians in the U.S. who have no idea how about the world works, who are given airtime, who live in their little eco chambers with commentators in the U.S., commentating on profound issues in the world and playing to a local audience. Okay, I just want to just... then use the, the world as their little playground. I just want to bring in uh, Mashari Muneni here from uh, Kenya. Um, do you agree with that? Uh, and also, I just want to ask the question, if the U.S. didn't pick up these so-called bad guys, which, of course, we have to question who is bad and uh, who is good, uh, who would? Well, it is not necessary that the U.S. has to do it alone the way it's been doing. I mean, it is mm -hmm. not necessarily true that if the U.S. does not do it, others will not do it. That is not true, because people have been arrested. Uh, Kenya, for instance, has arrested quite a number of people, and they are taken through the process. Mm. Uh, sometimes they get bail, sometimes they don't. But it is not true that if the U.S. does not do it, others will not do it. I think part of the negative uh, consequences of some of these behavior is that it's to negate the states as we know them, because the states are being rendered irrelevant to whatever the decision of the policymakers in Washington want. Uh, for instance, you cannot say that countries allow drones to be used in their places uh, to do what they do, and even uh, capturing some of these people, uh, there is doubt as to whether that is the case. What, that's why I would say that um, you do have here an extension of power, raw power, in a very clear way. And uh, it's possible that the example may be repeated by other countries who then feel that they are also justified to just go anywhere, get capture people, and then go and try them in their own court or in their own laws, uh, we're using their own laws, because they say they cannot trust those other jurisdictions. If that right. is a trend that is to be copied by others, uh, we have the making of a chaotic world where you don't know where, what's going to happen next. Mishari Munani, thank you so much. We have to take a break here, but more on the long arm of the law coming up in a moment. Stay with us. You're watching The Heat. <laughs>